Good morning. That is a beautiful hymn. It tells the whole story. <laughs> so let's thank the Lord for sending his son to be born into the world and to die for us. Amen? If there is one thing for which we are to be appreciative every day of our lives as Christians, it is for the fact that God sent his son to be our savior. I know sometimes our minds are caught up with the daily necessities and activities of life, you know. We have our lives to live, family to take care of, jobs to go to work, and illness to deal with. Well, there are so many things we have to deal with in our lives. And uh, sometimes we are taken up with those things, and which is normal for us as human beings. But we are more than that. We are believers in Jesus Christ. And we ought to appreciate him for who he is and for what he has done for us. And I'm always remi reminded of the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8, verse 32, that he who spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And the word freely in the text means without cost. <laughs> Didn't cost us anything. It cost God everything. Salvation is costly. But we are not the ones who incur the cost. God is the one who incurred the cost. Amen? That's why it's free. <laughs> cost God everything but it's free for, for the taking for anyone who wants it. That's the gospel in a nutshell. And so I want to encourage you to appreciate God, appreciate his son, and appreciate the work of the spirit who drew us to a saving, saving faith in Jesus Christ. So let's talk about this this morning in our Christmas message, if you want to call it that. My text is from Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, verse 25 to verse 35. I'll read the story. I want to draw some lessons from it for us as we contemplate and consider the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke's Gospel chapter 2 verses 25 to 35 we'll pray first father we thank you again today for the time we can gather together in your house to worship you lord we know why we are here and we know on what grounds we are able to be here it is because of this great sacrifice that your son came to offer for us that by him we might have forgiveness for our sins and acceptance in your eyes and therefore be able to ascribe honor and glory and praise and majesty to you, our great God and Savior. We thank you for your word. May you speak to us by today. And help us that the lessons we learn from it will be made practically applicable in our lives. And we would learn to appreciate you more for what you have done for us in Christ. And we would see Jesus as he is to be seen and hold on to him. Be with us through this hour, guide and direct our thoughts. We pray in Jesus' name. All God's people say, Amen. Luke chapter 2, verse 25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. 
and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also, that the thoughts of many may be revealed. I've entitled my message this morning in the form of a question. What do you see in Jesus? What do you see in Jesus? I'd like you to ponder this question this morning, especially if you profess to be a believer in Jesus Christ. What do you see in him? How do you view him? When you think of him, if you ever do, what kind of thoughts go through your mind as you think of him? You know, two people can look at the same object or the same person and they have completely different reactions or come to totally different conclusions regarding that personal thing. We all know that. That depends on our outlook. Two people can look at a person and one can see certain things about them and the other can see something completely different. We can look at a, a painting as another example, some of us can just see the colors on the canvas and some of us can, in a manner of speaking, go behind the canvas as it were and look into the heart and mind of the painter and see the image that he is trying to show to us. That depends on your outlook. And that is true, of course, because one person will look on the surface of things and the other would look for a deeper meaning behind a thing or in that person. That was true of those who, confront, who were confronted with Jesus while he was on earth. There are many people when they saw Jesus, in fact, most people who saw Jesus, saw him as an ordinary person. And I have no doubt that the disciples, in their first encounter with him, that that's what they thought of him. But you might remember at one point, that while they were on the Sea of Galilee, and the storm arose, while Jesus was asleep in the boat. You know the story, don't you? Jesus, they shook him up, woke him up, and... Don't you care that we perish? So he arose and he calmed the storm. And then they began, began to see him in a different light. What kind of man is this? And the, the word in the text, manner, means strange. What strange person is this that even 
the sea and the wind obey him. They began to see Jesus differently. The apostle Paul, in his second letter to the Corinthians in chapter 5, said, there was a time when we used to look at Jesus in a certain way as an ordinary person. That's my paraphrase, but that's what he means. He says, but now we don't see him that way any longer. You know why? Because Paul's eyes had been opened to see the true nature and the significance of Jesus. One of the people who had an early encounter with Jesus was a man named Simeon. I, we don't think too much of Simeon. I don't know when last you heard the name of this man in the Bible, but he's right there. He came face to face with Jesus. And when he saw the child, he understood, he knew the child's significance. The majority of the Jews were looking for the day when some great champion would arise and make them masters of the world and lords of the nations. That's what they were looking for. That's why when Jesus came, many people were disappointed in him, even some of his disciples. A couple um, Sundays ago, we were talking about those two men from Emmaus, last Sunday evening actually, who were traveling to Emmaus, on the road to Emmaus, and the Bible tells us that they were discouraged along the way, and Jesus drew near, and he, he told them, what are you talking about, and why are you so sad in your countenance? And they said, well, we were hoping, haven't you heard about Jesus? We were hoping that he would have been the one who would have brought glory to Israel and, 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 and bring deliverance to, to his people. They were looking for a physical savior. And that, what was, that was true of the majority of the Jewish people when Jesus was born. But Simeon was a different kind of person. He had no such dreams of glory. Simeon belonged to a group of people who were known in Palestine at the time as, quote, the quiet in the land. That's rather interesting. They lived lives of prayer, worship, and watchfulness. They lived in anticipation of the day that God would come and bring deliverance and comfort to his suffering people. Simeon was one of those people. When he saw the baby Jesus, he had the spiritual insight to recognize in him not just a child who was born of a woman in Palestine, but as the coming of God's salvation to the world. And I say, in order for us to truly perceive who Jesus is, we need spiritual insight. That is why there are many people who will hear the gospel, they'll walk away and never bother with it anymore. There are many people who come face to face, as it were, in their minds with Jesus, and they will walk away. But there are those who have the spiritual insight to see who Jesus really is, to see his significance, to appreciate his worth, and to embrace him as God's source of salvation. So I say this morning that spiritual insight gives a person the capacity to see in Jesus what others cannot or what others do not. An unbelieving person, a non-Christian person, can, will see Jesus in a certain way. As a great teacher, as a great moralist, as an ins in insightful master of knowledge, but they will never see him as the savior of sinners. By the way, I want you to see in this text there before us that th there is the working of the, the spirit is at work. Look at verses 25 to 27. 
Sometimes we can miss these things. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same was a devout man waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. Verse 26. And, be, and it was revealed unto him by whom? By the Holy Spirit that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Verse 27, and he came, what's the rest? By the Spirit. By the Spirit. You see it? Sometimes in Scripture we miss these things. So we see the Father sending the Son, and we see the Spirit giving insight to Simeon to recognize the Son, the source of God's salvation. And I say to you this morning that we can never truly appreciate who Jesus is until the Spirit of God opens our blind eyes so we can see his worth and value and to embrace him as our Lord and Savior. In the statement made by Simeon regarding Jesus, there are three things I want to point out. First of all, he saw Jesus as the salvation of God. This is rather interesting. In verses 28 to 30, we'll read this in a while. Secondly, he spoke of Jesus as the light of the world, the salvation of God, the light of the world, and then he sp spoke of Jesus <clears throat> as the revealer of hearts. Now, that's true of every single one of us this morning. Jesus <clears throat> is the one who saves us. Jesus is the one who gives light to our lives so that we come to know who God is. <clears throat> And I want to say that when we are confronted with Jesus, it is impossible to remain neutral where he is concerned. Jesus reveals our hearts. Let's look at these things. It shows us what we are really like. <coughs> in, in verse 28 now of the passage that we just read, Luke's Gospel chapter 2. Verse 28. Let me read verses 28 to 30. Then Simeon took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let your servant depart in peace. That means to depart from this life. According to thy word, For mine eyes have seen thy salvation. The first thing I want to point out to you this morning from Simeon's statement is that he saw Jesus as God's salvation. <coughs> While with his physical eyes, Simeon saw Mary's child. And we mustn't misunderstand this at all. He saw Mary's child. But he saw beyond that. What he saw spiritually, what he saw with spiritual insight was the Lord's salvation. He saw Jesus <clears throat> as the one who came to be 
and to do everything necessary to deliver sinners from the penalty and power of sin and to restore them to a right relationship with God. Because that's what salvation means. Let me repeat that. When Jesus came and Simeon saw him, he saw him as the one who came to be and to do everything that was necessary to deliver sinners from the penalty and power of sin and to restore them to a right relationship with God. That salvation, that's what it means to be saved. Jesus did not come to make you a church member. Jesus came to save you from your sins. Amen? Jesus did not come to make you prosperous. For those of you who are looking for money from Jesus, Jesus did not come to give you money. Jesus did not come to give you wealth like the false prophets today are preaching. Jesus did not come to make you 100% healthy to heal you of all your diseases. You have to die of something. Jesus did not come to make everybody love you. Stop wasting your time with that. Jesus came to rescue, to do everything that was needed to be done to deliver and to rescue you from the consequences and the penalty of your sins before God. That's what Simeon is saying. Lord, now let your servant die in peace. Be, and hear, hear the rest of it. Because my eyes have seen your salvation. I will tell you something. You will never die in peace until your eyes have come to see Jesus as the salvation of God. So you can be a church member. You can do everything you want for, for, for the Lord, so to speak. But you must know in your own heart that you have come to see who Jesus really is. That in him is the salvation of God. And you have come to put your trust in him. And when you have done that, you will say, Lord, now let your servant depart in peace. Because my eyes have seen your salvation. That's why I want to ask you the question this morning. What do you see in Jesus? What do you see in him? Because there are many religious people who see all kinds of things in Jesus. Jesus, give me money. Jesus, give me house. Jesus, give me land. Jesus, give me job. Jesus, give me husband. Jesus, give me wife. Jesus, give me children. Jesus, send me overseas. Jesus, Jesus may do those things or he may never do those things for you because that's not part of his plan for you. But I want to tell you one thing. There's one thing Jesus wants to do for you above everything else. He wants to save you. That's why he came. And that's what we must see in him. We must not see Jesus as the source of material wealth. We must see Jesus as our savior. As the one who left heaven's glory to die on the cross to save us from our sins. Isn't that the message that was sent by the angel of, that was given by, by, by the angel to Mary or to Joseph? Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall do what? Save his people from their sins. In Luke's gospel, <coughs> chapter 2, the message of the angels we read this morning, the heavenly host, they came and they brought the message. For unto you this day is born in the city of David. What is born? A savior. We, listen, folks. If you miss this, you miss everything else. The primary purpose, there were other things that Jesus came to do, you know. But I want to tell you, the focus of his heart and of his mind 
was to go to that cross to die on behalf of all who would come to put their faith and trust in him as Savior. This is salvation. So what do you see in Jesus? A provider of your wants? A baby in a manger? A doctor of letters? <laughs> a, a, a great philosopher? A master teacher? And by the way, he was all that and more. When people heard the teachings of Jesus, they were astonished, the Bible tells us. They said, this, this man teaches like, he doesn't teach like the Pharisees and the scribes. He teaches with authority. You know why? Because he was the son of God. What do you see in Jesus? For those of us who celebrate Christmas, what is it that you're celebrating? The birth of a baby who was born 2,000 years ago? Or the Savior who has saved you from sin? And I, dare to, I, I say this, and I dare to say it, that if you are not a Christian, what are you celebrating? Now we know Jesus was not born on December 25th. So we don't celebrate the day, we celebrate the person. But if you are not a Christian, what is it you're celebrating? You have nothing to celebrate. It is only Christians who must celebrate Christmas. <laughs> I dare to say that. Because you see, we're not talking about a day. We're talking about a person. We're talking about the Lord of glory. We're talking about the Son of God. We're talking about the sovereign of the universe. We're talking about the savior of sinners whom we have come to trust in as our Lord and Savior. If you miss, if all you see in Jesus is somebody who can do things for you, who can give you what you want, but not someone who can save you, I said to you, you have missed, completely missed, his worth in human history and in your life as a sinner. You've missed it. You hear him as he speaks in Luke's Gospel, chapter 19 and verse 10. For the Son of Man has come to do what? To seek. Hallelujah. We weren't seeking him. He came to seek us. To seek and to do what? To save what? Yeah, you know what the word lost means in the text? It's a beautiful word in the New Testament. Eh? This word means to be not in the rightful place. That's interesting, don't you think? Every once in a while you lose your, your keys or your glasses if you are like me. <laughs> At home I go when I, I, I put my, my, my keys in a certain place. Well, every once in a while, I can't find my keys. You know why? Well, I have misplaced them. They are not where they belong. And I want to say to you, that's our situation as sinners. That's what it means to be lost. It means that we are not in the place where we're supposed to be. We are supposed to be in a right relationship with God. We are supposed to be walking with God. Submitting to him, obeying him, trusting in him, living for him. And if we are not there, we are lost. But hallelujah, Jesus came to bring us back and to put us in the right place where we're supposed to be. In right relationship with God. Hallelujah. That's what it means to be saved. People tell us, oh, you say you're saved. No, no, I didn't say that. I am saved. Jesus said that. <laughs> and I, I, when it comes to my salvation, I have nothing to contribute. I have nothing to say. Jesus did everything, and I will take his word for it. Because you see, if you, if you depend on yourself for your salvation, you're in big trouble. Not just after you have received it, but to gain assurance, because you will always sin. You are always in trouble. But thank God for what Jesus says about those who come to him. All that the Father gives me 
shall come to me, says Jesus, and he who comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. So Jesus is the salvation of God. Is that how you see him this morning? What do you see in Jesus? You better see him as the savior of sinners. Amen? Jesus is God's answer to the sin problem. And we experience God's salvation only by trusting in him as our savior. You hear his words in John 3, 15 to 18? The Bible tells us, Jesus himself speaking, and as Moses, that who, as Moses lifted the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of, son of man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but hath everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever does what? Believeth in him should not perish, but hath everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be. Yes. Hallelujah. He that believeth on him is not condemned. By the way, that's the opposite of being saved, you know. You are either saved or you are condemned. You are either saved or you are lost. There is no middle ground on this issue. Jesus doesn't allow us to straddle the fence. Either we trust in him or we reject him. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Why? Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Yes? And John 20, 30 and 31. I learned this verse as a kid going to Bible school, by the way, in vacation Bible school. You don't believe that. John 20, 30, 31. But these things and many other things, verse 30, and many other things truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, in John's gospel. Jesus did so many things. Not enough books to write them all. The Bible tells us that elsewhere. But these are written. Hallelujah. That you might do what? Believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that what? Believing you might have. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And in 1 John, 1 John chapter 5, verses 9 to 13, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his son. That's what God is saying of the son. He that believeth on the son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar. That's regarding Jesus. Because, because he hath, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his son. What's the rest? And this is the record that God has given to us eternal. And this life is in? That's it. That's salvation, you know. This life is in whom? His son. What's the rest? He that have the son. Hallelujah. Do you have the son? Let me ask you differently. Do you have life? How do you know that? If you have the son. Remember the words of Simeon when he saw the child? Lord, let your servant now depart in peace because my eyes have seen your salvation. What did he mean by that? Because to see Jesus is to see the salvation of God. He that hath the Son of God, he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. I'll pause there. That's it. So what do you see in Jesus? What is his significance in your life? Of what worth or value is he to you this Christmas season? So for those of you who are going to eat and drink rum, Christians drinking rum these days. Those of you who are going to overeat and overdrink this Christmas season, 
Make sure that you know what you're celebrating. And make sure you know why you're celebrating. And if you are not a Christian, I forbid you. Boy, that's a hard one. <laughs> if you are not a Christian, you have no cause, no reason for celebration. Because you don't know the son. If you want to celebrate, then come to him. Recognize who he is. Ask God to open your eyes and your heart so you can see who Jesus is. And you call upon him and say, Jesus, I am the sinner. But I know that you came to save sinners like me. And I call upon you to save me today. And the Bible tells us that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let me go. I, I can go on with this. The second point. Jesus, Simeon saw as what? The salvation of God. The second one is that he saw him as what? The light. Oh boy. There's a little song that we sing every once in a while. The whole world was lost in the darkness of sin. The light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light. It is shining for thee. Sweetly the light has shone upon me. Once I was blind, but now, let me hear you, but, but now, yes, the light of the world is Jesus. That's it, you know, that's the message. That's exactly what Simeon says to us in the text, or he spoke of Jesus in the text. Verse 30, for mine eyes have seen the salvation, thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. Hallelujah. This is not salvation for some people. It's for all people. Jews and Gentiles, black and white, rich and poor, educated and illiterate, everybody comes the same way. My eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before all the face of all people. A light to do what? To lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. So Jesus is the light of the world. Now, Simeon's world was not, was not like ours in many ways. The technology, the advancement in medicine and knowledge and all of that, the world wasn't like that. But Simeon's world, on, on, in, in, a, in a different sense, was very much like ours. Spiritually, it was a world lost in spiritual darkness and in desperate need of deliverance from sin. Isn't that where the world is today? And this is where the world has always been. From the moment Adam and Eve sinned in the garden and rebelled against God, the world was plunged into darkness. Jesus came as the light. Despite man's many advances, his nature is the same. Did you hear me? Education doesn't change your nature. It might make you a little more sophisticated. <laughs> you might be a little more refined. Money doesn't change your nature. It makes you worse. Makes some people worse. All the knowledge in the world will not change your nature. Certain things about you will change. Might make you a little more proud that you have a little more knowledge than some other people. Like some of us are. But your nature remains the same. Yes? And, and may I, let me add one more thing to this. If man's nature is the same today as it was in Simeon's day, then... Man's need is the same today as it was in Simeon's day. So with all our knowledge and our education and our advancements and our money and our sophistication and our heights, whatever we may have and to whatever we may attain, I want to say to you that in our nature we are sinful creatures. We are in the darkness of sin and in desperate need of salvation. And Jesus came to bring it to us. 
That was Isaiah's prophecy. In Isaiah chapter 45, 49, sorry, verses 5 and 6. He spoke about a light to lighten the Gentiles. Spread with, with me. And now, serve the Lord. Let me hear you. It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to whom? The Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end. 800 years before Jesus was born, Isaiah was given the prophecy. A light to lighten the Gentiles. So when Simeon comes and he sees the child, the light shone. <laughs> to be a light to the Gentiles. You know, I thank God that Jesus came to be the light of the world. And that was his declaration in John chapter 8. And there are so many other passages in the Old Testament and the New as well. <clears throat> John chapter 8 verse 12 says what? Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of light. Boy, this, this has a whole history here. Jesus spoke this in a, at a very dramatic time. The Jewish people were celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles. You'd come and pour out water as an, as an offering before the Lord. And as part of that celebration, they, would, they had a, a, fe, a, a festival. On the first day of the seven-day week of that festival, they observed what we call our festival of lights. That's what it was for them. They called it a festival of illumination, but same thing. There were some great and massive candlesticks that they would light up and put in the middle of the court of the women in the temple. And th that, that was so bright, we are told, it would light up the whole city for miles around. It was during that time Jesus came and made the declaration and tell them, you know what? You see all these lights you have lighting up the city? I want to tell you that after seven days, this light will have to be put out. And it can only give light to the city. Only for a short time. But I am the light, not only of Jerusalem and of Palestine, but of the world. And I give light into the life of every single human being who comes to me. When the Apostle Paul was confronted by Jesus on the Damascus Road, you can read about it in Acts chapter 26 where Paul gives his testimony. He says the Lord told him that he had chosen him so that he would turn men from darkness into what? Light. And by the way, may I say to you this morning that this is what gospel preaching is about. Gospel preaching is about pointing men to Jesus as the light as the one to whom they must look to dispel the darkness of sin from their hearts and their lives and to light up their path so that they might learn to follow God. But what do we have in our world today? Well, hear what John tells us in his gospel. <coughs> Excuse me, Jesus in John chapter 3, speaking, 18 and 19. He that believeth on the Son... He that believeth on him, rather, is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. What's the rest? And this is the condemnation. What is it? That light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Let's stay here. 
You can know if you are a Christian or not it's in very simple terms, you know. What do you love? Darkness or light? Eh? That's it. Not physical, yeah? What do you love? Do you love your life of sin and rebellion and disobedience? You're in darkness. But if you want to follow Jesus, and by His grace you are endeavoring to live for Him, you are in the light. That's it. No middle ground. There are some people who want gray light. <laughs> there is no such thing as gray light. You ever saw gray light? There are blue light, red light, green light, all kinds of colors, but there's no gray. Either it's bright or it's dark. What is darkness, by the way? <clears throat> there's no definition for darkness. We know darkness when we see it, but as soon as the light shines, the darkness goes away. Where does it go? We don't know, but that is how powerful light is. <laughs> what, a wonderful, what a wonderful statement made by Jesus here. And I say to you this morning, that all who are without Christ are in spiritual darkness. These are the words of Jesus, by the way. But Jesus is the light who reveals God to men and leads them back to God. Jesus is the Savior, the salvation of God. Is that how you see him? Jesus is the light of the world. And I want to say to you, <clears throat> if you are not a Christian, you are still in darkness. And you will walk in darkness. And one day, you'll plunge into outer darkness. But Jesus gives light to all who come to him. Finally, Thirdly and finally, in verses 34 and 35 of Luke's gospel. Let me just read this to you. It, it's, a, it, it's, it's a little involved. I want to pull something out of it here. And show you what Simeon said about Jesus and the hearts of men. Verse 34 and verse 35. And Simeon blessed them, Mary and Joseph, and said unto Mary, <clears throat> his mother behold this child is set for the fall and rising again of many and for a sign or a token which shall be spoken against there will be much opposition is the idea to Jesus yea a sword shall pierce through thy so own soul also we know, that, we know when that happened yes when Jesus was crucified and by the way it wasn't just then that was the the zenith, the, the, the height of it. But Mary must have felt hurt and pain for her son for all the things they did and said to him and about him. Eh? Think about these things, you know. If you, if you are a mother, if you love your child and you, you, everything you, you're hearing, and you know they're not true, but everything you're hearing is terrible things, it will not hurt you? Let me hear you, man. Of course, it will pierce your soul. In fact, you will not even want to talk to the people who say those things about your child. And humanly speaking, you're right. Humanly speaking. May I emphasize that? All right. <laughs> Spiritually speaking, you're wrong. <laughs> you must pray for them. Yeah? Verse 35. What does he say? Yea, a sword shall pierce your own heart, your own soul. That. Now, you see this? The words in parentheses block them out. And let me read verse 34 again. Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against of that. You got it? The thoughts of many hearts. Maybe what? Revealed. What does that mean? What Simeon is saying in very simple terms is this. That it is impossible... To remain neutral when you are confronted with Jesus. The true condition of your heart will show. In other words, Jesus, when Jesus shows up, 
He shows you up. He shows you up. Why is that? We have seen Jesus is the central figure in man's redemption and therefore man's eternal destiny. You notice what Simeon says, that he is the cause of the falling and the rising. What does that mean? Well, there are many who would stumble and be lost. And there are many who will come face to face with him and be saved. That's the idea. When you, when you come face to face with Jesus, either you pronounce your lostness or you become saved. It all depends on your response to him. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 6 and verse 8. 2 verse 8. At my final passage. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. What's the rest? Unto you therefore which believe. He is what? Let me hear you, man. Unto you which believe he is? That's the rising. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is the head of the corner. Let's have a rest now. And a stone of what? Now, get it there? You see it? For some, for those who believe, what is he? Precious. But for those who do not believe, he's a stone of what? You must fall. You must fall. You can't be neutral where Jesus is concerned. And I want to tell you, young people and children who are growing up in this church here, you, have, you are hearing about Jesus all the time, eh? I want to tell you something. Your response to Jesus will determine whether you rise or you fall. If he is precious to you, it is because you have believed on him. But if you refuse to believe on him, I don't care how educated you become, how many doctorates you have, and how much money you make in the future, I want to tell you, you must fall and you will be confounded and condemned for eternity. You will be. And I say this with pain in my heart for many of you. And I'm sure <laughs> that you understand this truth. So let me close by saying to you this morning that your response to Jesus reveals the attitude of your heart toward him and determines your eternal destiny. Those who accept him are saved. They rise. Hallelujah. That's what Simeon meant. And those who do not accept him are lost for eternity. They fall. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Why? Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Have you believed? Have you come to Jesus? Have you called upon him? H how do you see him? What do you see in Jesus? A baby in a manger? What do you see in Jesus? A peasant in Palestine? What do you see in Jesus? A great philosopher? What do you see in Jesus? A master teacher? By the way, he was all of those things, but those things will mean absolutely nothing to you until you come to see him as your savior. Simeon's encounter with Jesus is a lesson in spiritual insight. We learn of the true nature and significance of Jesus that he is the salvation of God, the light of the world, and the revealer of hearts. Let me ask you as I close, is he your savior? Is Jesus your savior? Or what, how do you see him? What do you see in him? 
If he is, rejoice. So now you can go home and, and eat all the pork you want. <laughs> and all the cake and all the stuff. You have prepared for Christmas. That's for those of you who love pork, eh? And you heard me say those of you who love pork. You have good reason to rejoice. But if you do not know the Lord, you have no reason to rejoice. But here is what. He is available to all and to everyone who will trust in him as the Savior. So trust him today. Amen? And then you'll have a very, very happy Christmas. <laughs> because you will say, I have nothing, but I have Jesus. That's enough. Amen? Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. Thank you for its truth. May, may you minister to us by it as we contemplate these truths. Help us not to forget these things as we go today, dear Father, but to make them a part of us. To embrace them. To appreciate them. And to have the assurance in our hearts that we, we don't just see Jesus as a mere man, though a great man, but as the Son of God and the Savior of sinners, our own Savior today. May these words ring, ring in our ears, take fruit in our hearts, and bring forth fruit, fruit in our lives for your honor and your glory. We pray in Jesus' name.